Thank you, Sherry, and good afternoon to everyone, and uh, good day to all who are coming from some of the further time zones. Very happy to be here this afternoon to uh, work with you and to uh, talk a little bit about some of the less the lesser known and lesser spoken about uh, applications of the MCMI-4, and that is particularly therapeutic applications. I think that there's uh, often a misconception about the MCMI-4, which I'll say much more about in just a little bit, but uh, a point that I really want to get across is that we really believe that uh, the instrument is its primary use and its primary focus in, in many clinical applications is primarily to add incremental validity to a diagnostic application. Um, what we want to be able to do today and really to introduce in, in a much broader way is a methodology for developing and utilizing language that's embedded in the theory behind the MCMI-4 to be able to best use that for feedback and further therapeutic applications. I'm noticing uh, something in the chat box. I'm getting a little bit of feedback myself, and if anybody could just kind of uh, type in briefly, are you getting feedback or any choppiness from my speech right now? Because I'm, I'm not sure if we're getting uh, a clear audio signal. Um, anybody in, uh, in the host position, if they could uh, feedback on that? It's clear? Okay, thank you very much. I think we are getting some feedback from somebody on the line here, so I just want to make sure uh, that we're getting things as we need to. Okay, I'm going to do my best to ignore the feedback that's coming through my speaker right now, and uh, we will continue. So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing more specifically. The agenda for today and probably the main goal of this is to talk directly about how the relationship works between Milan's evolutionary theory, which is what the test is built on, and therapeutic goals that you may have for somebody being assessed. I know we sometimes divide ourselves into um, some of our roles, such as either an assessor or a therapist, but really we should, if, even if we're in one of those roles specifically, we really should be thinking about the ultimate application. And the way to be able to do that is to really get into some of the aspects of the theory that lend themselves to certain kinds of therapeutic language that becomes much more meaningful for the individual. From there, we put in the application, that is describing the data from the MCMI and how that can possibly inform treatment. Now, this is the second in a series of three webinars on the MCMI-4 that we're currently conducting through Pearson Assessments, the first being a general introduction, which is really uh, kind of the, in, the, the introductory um, beginner's level sort of webinar. And there's a third that goes into a case example more into detail, and that's probably the most advanced. This is intermediary. One of the things that I like to do to kind of move forward to get a sense of how to tailor my remarks as we go through this is to take a quick poll and you can see on your screen right now, if you could respond to this, have you used the MCMI? And the direction is select all that apply. So if you have used the MCMI-3, but you're now using the MCMI-4, please uh, mark both of them. And we want to get a sort of an idea of where we are in this. We'll wait for just a few moments. We have about 60 people on the line. Uh, I want to see if we can get most people responding to this. And we're at approximately 40 right now. So please don't be shy. We're not looking to see who's doing what. Thank you. Okay, we'll give just a moment or two more to uh, to finish up our our unofficial tally here. This is not going into any kind of an organized study or anything like that. It's just kind of a, an indicator for the immediate presentation. What I see here is that uh, there are probably the majority of people here are actually now using the four, assuming that people who are using the MCMI-3 and have marked that are also marking the four box as well. So we have a group of people that have some experience with this instrument. For those of you um, who have not yet used either, 
I'm going to include some remarks to help you sort of uh, catch up and see what's going on. This does get, uh, the, these webinars do tend to get into quite a bit of detail. So uh, if you have questions, please don't feel shy about uh, putting any questions into the chat box and we'll do what we can at the end to answer anything that might not have been clear. Okay, so a pretty good uh, smattering of results here with most people here having some experience and a good number actually moving into the MCMI4 at this point. Okay, so that in mind, we'll get a little bit more into the theory, but before we do that, we want to really kind of just reemphasize for a moment what it is that we're after here and to take it directly from the, the uh, MCMI creator and chief architect's mouth. This is a quote that uh, Dr. Milan was quoted as saying while we were working on the early stages of the MCMI-4, and that is that it was specifically designed, as are all the Milan inventories, to facilitate the therapeutic plans of the clinician. The emphasis is mine, but I know from many years of working with Dr. Milan that that really was the intent all the way across. Like I said before, there's really kind of a, a sense that the instrument, because it's so closely coordinated to diagnostic constructs, that uh, its main purpose is really to help clarify a diagnosis, to add incremental validity, and to be able to say, you know, what percentage of what might be might be a diagnostic concern. I want to say, and I want to preface by saying, that's really not unimportant whatsoever. We do want to be as diagnostically specific as possible. But let's kind of take a look at the general beliefs and, and try to clarify a little bit as far as that goes. Uh, what clinicians tend to believe? The MCMI, all of its uh, legacy instruments, as well as the MCMI-4, they're just designed to diagnose personality disorders. That is that, you know, we just want to say, okay, what what's the purpose? The purpose is to say, I think there's a personality disorder there. Let's see what it is. It's not really the best use for it. I mean, we want to... We, we want to definitely encourage those to be able to clarify personality diagnoses that way. It does assist in the incremental validity for what we used to call an access to diagnosis or what we just now refer to as those in the domain of personality disorders, but this really is only its most basic use. Another misconception, an understandable one, is that the MCMI is just basically the DSM criteria put out on a test. And there's a lot of reason to believe that, although there are elements of it, including several, actually five personality prototypes that are not included in the current DSM, but for the most part have been included in appendices of, of prior DSMs. Now for those that are included, I wanna make sure that this is clear. There's overlap there. It definitely covers the, the PD criteria from the DSM, but that criteria are coordinated with DSM and they're not identical. What that basically means is that the way that these personality prototypes are constructed goes beyond, not just includes, but goes beyond the diagnostic criteria that's in the DSM. So it overlaps considerably, if not entirely, but expands out to, uh, to go into some areas that the DSM by its nature really isn't designed to do. Diagnostic and statistical, I mean, the idea behind that, although this was not the case in the early DSMs, the, uh, the current DSMs uh, have been coming from the perspective of being atheoretical and being only those kinds of criteria which we can objectively measure. Some of the areas that we can't as objectively measure, although we have better means of measurement now, are areas that speak to the psychodynamic, some of the biophysical, and some of the self-image kinds of areas. So the theory actually goes beyond that, and the therapeutic language that can arise from the use of the MCMI speaks much more to its therapeutic values. Somewhat related to the first point that I made was this statement. Well, the, uh, the MCMI is really only applicable to people with personality disorders. You have to have a personality disorder in order to have any useful information come out of it. That is actually patently untrue. To clarify for this, and this is more the case with the MCMI-4 than it has been with the others, it is still a clinical test. It's not designed for 
being able to distinguish, differentiate general, normal, adaptive personality patterns as a whole. But those adaptive, normal personality patterns are all elements that when they're out of balance, when they're inflexible, when they become maladaptive, start to resemble more and more personality pathology. But there's a fairly wide bandwidth of an area that goes between what we would call ideal functioning, which if we were to be honest with ourselves, nobody really functions quite that ideally, all the way through to the much more pronounced personality disorders. The area in between is where we see most of our clinical population, and that's what's most applicable here. Are those people who are experiencing some kind of a difficulty that is in the clinical realm? And the test can be used across a wide swath of that population. There's also an argument made that the test tends to over-pathologize or just automatically label, and if you're really doing an assessment on sort of a judge the book by its cover sort of a level, that probably is true. But I would argue actually that the labels that you see on the test are most likely the least valuable part. They do help in incrementally creating a diagnosis where it's necessary. That is very true. But the descriptions rather than the labels are really where we like to put most of our emphasis here. To facilitate part of that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later in today's webinar, the MCMI-4 now has an option where you can print a profile page using abbreviations for all the personality labels as well as all of the uh, clinical symptomology labels, such that if you are so inclined to do this, and this helps with, uh, with feedback on many occasions I've found, that you can utilize the profile page as a graphic that you can show a person to understand how much of what is going into different aspects of their personality or, relatively speaking, how much uh, they might be affected by a particular clinical symptomology. And really, when you get more advanced with the instrument, how you put those two elements together. So I find that to be very useful, and part of the reason for that is that I've also had the experience of people asking me questions about um, why something is elevated when it's obviously you know, coming up and looking right at that label. So rather than have that there, even when it's not necessarily the accurate diagnostic, but maybe some elements of it, I would rather have the option to be able to explain what that's about by using something that's not quite as obvious. We're not we're not holding back on information, we're actually giving more information, but doing so in what I think is a cleaner way. That said, um, for your own purposes, for ease of use, it is also entirely uh, possible and acceptable to print the profile page with the full labels. And finally, um, categorical like the DSM. There's a lot of talk now about DSM categories versus dimensions and most of us familiar with a lot of the DSM's development know about the dimensional approach that was, uh, that was advanced in the appendix, which was originally intended to be the main body of the personality disorder section. The MCMI takes an approach that is neither categorical nor dimensional in full. What we call our personalities is really prototypes. It's a prototypal approach converges both of those aspects of both categories and dimensions by being able to assemble enough dimensions to be able to say it fits into a certain criterion set that can be utilized with the ease of use as a category but has much more the descriptive qualities. And finally, really, you don't need to know all the theory. The labels tell you all you need to know, and that's really what this whole webinar is about. Is that is, we're moving beyond the labels here. We're not just trying to identify specifics of some personality function as a function of diagnosis. We want to be able to say, if you have a diagnosis, what do you do with that more practically? So that's where we begin to get into how it is that we can affect that. The way that I encourage people to affect that by using the MCMI is to go beyond the instrument itself, which is built on and developed on the back of an evolutionary theory that Dr. Milan had worked on throughout his career, beginning as a biosocial learning theory, 
and eventually working its way into something that was much more involved in the natural processes of our of our natural world. And what probably wasn't as emphasized throughout his career, but something that I've really kind of taken upon myself to emphasize as much as possible when I speak about this, is if that theory is something that speaks to the basic motivations of how a person sets themselves in the world, positions themselves in terms of what it is that they're after and how they interrelate to people, why not be able to use that language to be able to help them affect change that they want, to be able to identify what it is that's going on with them and how it is that that might be able to, in the same sense as the theory, evolve into how it is that they want to be and, and how it is that they might benefit from a better level of flexibility or clarity. But to understand how that works, we go back to the basic idea of how is the test how is the test constructed? How is the uh, how is the theory set up to reflect human as well as all natural world phenomena? And embedded in that, as you go through this webinar, you begin to see how it is that those basic bedrocks of how we put all this information together can lend itself to effective therapeutic language and feedback and report writing and all the other emphases that we may have in the work that we do. So let's begin with just the basic presses on the evolutionary model of personality and kind of understand what this is really about. I like to describe this mostly like I inferred before as a motivational theory. What are the basic motivations of, of human beings and how are they a natural reflection of the natural world? We begin by the premise that any living organism, human or otherwise, anything that has any kind of a life first has to exist. It's a very, very basic premise. Not a very Not a complex sort of a idea. What becomes interesting is how I would like to describe how people tend to energize themselves on this. The existence is one in which we figure out how it is that they invoke their energy. That is, by trying to sustain life as best as possible, if we're looking at the top right corner, which is the life-sustaining or pain-avoiding sort of premise, or whether they tend to try to enhance life as much as possible, not really giving a, a clear concern for survival in and of itself, but getting as much out of life as possible. You can understand that a human being unlike many other organisms, would need to have a variety of possible responses and possible ways of interacting with their world on this level. So some flexibility is absolutely necessary, and everybody is going to have their point on this continuum where they're most comfortable, where they tend to function the best, but with the idea that there's adaptivity and flexibility necessary in order to lead an effective life. Where you start to see more disordered personalities is where you see when somebody's stuck at one or another point on a more extreme end of the continuum or where somebody might have some disclarity, which is usually expressed as what we call a reversal. Uh, those are fairly typical of both the sadistic and masochistic patterns where a person is more drawn towards those things that are painful or more focused on those things that are painful and almost experiences them as pleasurable. So that's the most basic element of the overall theory. We then start to look at how it is that from the point of existing, how it is that a person interacts, how a person works with the environment, how an individual organism of some sort adapts themselves to whatever it is that, that's necessary in an environment. And persons, organisms, tend to fall along this continuum. That is either finding an environment suitable enough for themselves to be able to exist within it, changing themselves to fit where it's necessary, adapting, accommodating into an environment, versus the other strategy, which is changing that environment going into an environment and saying, this is not suitable for me, I'm going to make it suitable to my needs. 
and acting in a more active sort of a manner. When you start to put existence and adaptation, these first two continua into a group, what you can start to see are the basis of some of the personalities. Whereas two different people might be more geared towards, say, the pain orientation, one who is more active, and that is trying to fix things and make sure that the pain doesn't really bother them in any particular way is much different than someone who is passive and just assumes it's going to be there. We'll talk a little bit more about those patterns very shortly. Finally, we have replication. This last group of the three basic polarities has to do with how we respond to others in our environment, not just the environment itself. These are based on the evolutionary concepts of our strategy versus K strategy in evolutionary biology. Here we look at a strategy such as that of an oyster. This has to do with replication, with, with uh, making sure that there are more than just us that exist right now in order to be able to propagate a species. An oyster will lay five million eggs or so over the course of a lifetime. But that oyster will never take care of those eggs. There's no such thing as parentage as, as far as that's concerned, as parenting. Enough of those five million eggs are going to survive. That is a self-oriented strategy. The opposite extreme of the great mammals are many of the animals who have a much more limited number of offspring and have varying degrees of how it is that they parent those offspring. We want to make sure that as many of them survive as possible. That is an emphasis on the other. Translating that to personality, we can understand how it is that somebody is much more nurturing of the self, that is making sure that their own needs are met to the exclusion or at least uh, non-involvement of others, to the other extreme where most of the emphasis is on other people and there's little regard or little emphasis given to the self. And again, this as well as all of the strategies, when a person can work within their their best place in any of these continua with some ability to be flexible and adapt to what's necessary, that's where you find the human beings who are functioning at their best level. And the more constricted, the more inflexible, the less adaptive you find the more you're going to start to see difficulties in personality, especially when it comes to being able to effectively work within an environment and effectively interact with other people. All of that is kind of abstract and fairly heady, but those are the building blocks. And when you start to understand what those building blocks are, you start to understand how it is that the scales of the MCMI are built begin to put this together into some aspects of how the test construction works. We move from these motivating aims into the personality prototypes, and you should think of each of the personality scales as its own prototype. Schizoid, avoidant, is a 1 or 2A, 2B would be melancholic, 3 would be dependent, and so on. These arise from the different patterns of those emphases that I just spoke about. Um, the avoidant being an active pain orientation, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on that momentarily. Um, melancholic or depressive being a passive pain orientation, just to show one basic idea of what those are. These are the basic building blocks of those personalities, but they don't tell the full story. Even when you have just one elevation on an MCMI, there's really much more to the story than that. You can look at some of the elements that make it up to see much more. But most of the time, we have admixtures. Most of the time we have combinations of combinations of personality patterns. But usually these admixtures say that there are patterns of one prototype and patterns of another, but we can do what we can to be able to compare those combinations with what we see in the textbook to get some idea of how related they are to one another. A very good guide for this, and probably the most comprehensive, is the uh, Disorders of Personality 3rd Edition that identifies the 15 prototypes that make up all 15 of the scales. Uh, there is one additional, that is the Turbulent Scale, that has been added to both the theory in the Disorders of Personality book as well as the MCMI-4.
And those basic building blocks help you to be able to put these together in what I like to refer to as sort of a color wheel sort of a way. So the combination of prototypes you might think of as different elements of a color wheel. If you had a color wheel with 15 primary colors, you could get a sense of just how vast personalities are, but you also get a sense of what those personalities are when you put the colors together. So if you had a 2A, 2B combination, that is an avoidant and melancholic combination, and avoidant was red and melancholic was blue, you would actually then have a purple combination. Think of it sort of in that way. It's neither one nor the other, but that's how it becomes dimensionalized. And the next two slides are going to show each of those individually, and then I'll talk a little bit about how that might coincide into one personality. So the first of those, scale 2A, the avoidant, and you can see here also the uh, abbreviation that I was referring to before. SR avoid is something that can come up on on a, uh, a variant of the profile page that you can print so that a, a person looking at it would see that rather than the full label of avoidant. Here, as I was talking about before, we have um, the preservation, life preserving or pain orientation, as well as an active modification orientation. Putting that together, we have that description of a pure prototype avoidant personality who does whatever he or she can to remain safe, to remain guarded, to make sure that the outside world is as non-vexatious as is possible. And the emphasis is always on that pain. But the way of that person to be able to engage is really very active, very much geared towards keeping defenses up, very much active towards guarding themselves, which leaves very little room to be able to enhance life, to seek out any pleasure, and very little room to be able to relax as well. We take that in uh, contrast with a closely related pattern, and that is the DF melon, or scale 2B melancholic pattern, which is formerly known as depressive. We still have that pain orientation, but here we have a passivity accommodating, just kind of saying, I'm going to let things be. best thing I can do is not to fight what is threatening, what is noxious, what is troubling to me, what makes me sad, but to just kind of understand that that's the way that it's going to be. I'm just going to have to give up, give in, and simply accept what that's all about. Question becomes, and this sort of sets up the thesis for the overall webinar today, what does that tell us about the basic motivations of this person? Let's say that we had an, an MCMI-4 that, have eat, that had each of these elevations. We had somebody who was relatively similar in elevation on scales 2A and 2B. So highly geared and oriented towards this pain orientation, but also some conflict some level of non-clarity between being active versus being passive. So they endorse quite a bit about wanting to keep their defenses up, but at the same time, the predominance in a lot of places was to just simply give up. There, if you start to look at what are the possibilities of relaying this to the person, you might be able to focus in on where that conflict is and be able to give the feedback that says that it may be possible that you have a very difficult time knowing what's really important to guard against, what's really noxious, what, what is it that you can kind of let go, and what is it that you feel is really all that sensitive. And that can be really disconcerting, possibly to the point where you kind of lose focus of and lose track of um, what keeps you coherent, what keeps you okay. This is not necessarily the, uh, the go-to language for that. It depends on the individual. It's just one example of what might be happening if you assess a person and you begin to see that kind of a combination. This is the kind of information that you can glean from looking at those combinations on the MCMI, coming from the theoretical perspective. Okay, so let's move on then. 
and look a little bit more towards the some of the nuances that are in the MCMI and how that can reflect in some of the language and some of the therapeutic application that you then use, as well as some of the more molecular components that lead into the facets of the MCMI and, and how they can be therapeutically effective as well. I spoke a little bit earlier about the range that the MCMI is really after, and that is that it's not to assess normal adaptive personality, but rather to say, with a person who is experiencing some kind of a difficulty, whether it's egosyntonic or egodystonic, how is it that their personality as it stands reflects and affects what's going on? And ultimately, how does that interact with and, and uh, modify or modify or otherwise colorize the kinds of experiences they might have, such as anxiety, depression, somatic symptoms, bipolar, dysthymic, or um, persistent depressive sorts of difficulties, PTSD, and so on, those things that are included in the clinical symptomology in the MCMI. So this element that we're looking at right now speaks to where a person might fall within that range. So the Disorders of Personality 3rd Edition started to really explicate how it is in what ranges a person might be functioning. And so each prototype is described based on three different levels that are continue of their own. And that really broadens the range much more explicitly. This was the case of the MCMI-3 and the earlier MCMIs as well, but it wasn't as delineated as this. It was basically a range of adaptive and a, ra and a range of maladaptive. Now it's broken down into these three each coinciding with a specific base rate scale, or ba uh, base rate score. A normal style is an area where we might see a person who is generally adaptive, but in some areas might get into some difficulty, and we can understand how it is that a particular score between 60 and, 75 and 74 as a base rate might affect other challenges that they have other difficulties that they might be exhibiting. If, uh, if a person is relatively shy, reticent, um, and they score 64, perhaps, on, on the avoidance scale, that's not necessarily somebody who can't deal with people whatsoever, but that's a person who really is going to show some aspects of holding back and maybe have some self-concerns that they don't like to share that's going to affect how it is that they experience an anxiety or depression. So it's important information. It's also important if that's a secondary score and something else is higher, how it is that one affects the other as well. The next range is 75 to 84, where we say this is more of an abnormal trait or a type. Here we're looking at moderately maladaptive personality attributes, those kinds of difficulties where we can say with some predictability, this may get a person into that range of not as functional more regularly, more predictably, more so something that we can identify as something that creates a difficulty, possibly more often than not, but not yet at the point where it's fully debilitating in terms of how it is that they live their lives. Um, the range of 85 and above is more reflective of the clinical disorder. And that is there's a higher likelihood of greater personality dysfunction, probably at an empiring level, probably most of the time. Now, all that being said, that, um, in terms of sensitivity and specificity, there's no instrument that perfectly predicts where a person really lies. It is possible that somebody who scores between 60 and 74 may actually be presenting with a personality disorder. On the other hand, it's, very, it's also possible that somebody scoring above 85 does not reflect a personality disorder, but does reflect um, aspects of that style. Again, no instrument is able to do that. You have to look at all of the information that you have in front of you in order to make a real determination that way, including the context. I uh, can recall a, one person that I had who was an internationally ranked athlete uh, very, a very elite athlete is an Olympic, uh, an Olympic athlete actually, who scored as high as you could possibly score in the narcissistic range. Now, and this person did have those characteristics, but did not have, from anything that I could really tell, 
a narcissistic personality disorder. What was going on in large part there was this person was so into the world where that was so much a part of the culture, was building yourself up mostly artificially to, be, to put yourself into the mindset of being the greatest and being the, the most elite. So much so that that started to become a problem for her in terms of dealing with people that were not those kinds of athletes. And that was part of the overall presentation. But I would not put somebody like that into a disordered range. That would be somebody who is having some identity difficulties based on what it is that they do and treat that as such. So um, the major goal here is to more adequately capture a range of functioning, to be able to say that there's not just some artificial cutoff point to say this is a disorder or this is not a disorder, but to get a sense of how much something in that personality spectrum really affects somebody. To be able to facilitate that, once again, we now have this spectrum where we have a lot more delineated in terms of description. So across the top here, uh, we have the names of the spectra themselves, and these are all the, all the abbreviated labels that can be used for describing those. The more common labels that we're used to are under primarily under the clinical disorder range, that is that highest range of 85 and above, also including the normal style and descriptive terms for each of those as well as the abnormal types. One difference that we do find though is towards the bottom and those are the three scales that are thought to be in and of themselves more clinically significant, schizotypal, borderline, and paranoid. I usually describe these as structurally compromised personality prototypes. That is that in the normal style, there really isn't so much a normal adaptive variant of that, but these are usually more maladaptive variants of the other 12 scales, such that in that range of 60 to 74, we are going to see terms such as eccentric, unstable, mistrustful that are more reflective of what we usually would call an abnormal type in the mid-range there are schizotypal, borderline, and paranoid, the familiar terms that we use, which leaves room for a much more disordered level, which are the older terms of schizophrenic, cyclophrenic, and paraphrenic, which Dr. Milan began using again in that last variant of the, of, uh, the disorders book. Moving to a more molecular level, what we have here are the basic expressions of personality, which you see at the top are those that uh, we covered earlier, that is how it is that the prototypes are put together, that is the three continua, the three polarities, and how it is that they express themselves in terms of more specific attributes. All these attributes, and there are eight for each one of the prototypes, are broken down into functional domains, that is for primarily those that demonstrate an action demonstrate a kind of a phenomena that we can more objectively measure, as well as structural domains, and those are primarily those characteristics that we need to infer, such as self-image, such as some of the intrapsychic components, such as mood and temperament. Being able to put all that together, let me see here for one sec. For your reference, we're not going to spend a lot of time just in the interest of time today on the more specifics of these, but you can see that uh, there are four functional domains, four structural domains, and a little bit more broken down in terms of what each are in terms of emotional expression, being primarily behavioral, interpersonal conduct, having to do with the interactions of people, cognitive style, reflective of how a person's mindset works. Uh, more of a phenomenologic sort of a thing related to how we would think about many things in a cognitive behavioral sort of a sense. Intrapsychic dynamics under functional domains and then moving into structural, we have self-image, intrapsychic content, that also being a more psychodynamic kind of an idea. Architecture having to do with how the inner world is constructed and then the biology of things, mood or temperament. You look at these, they relate fairly directly to different modalities of psychotherapy, such that if we were able to identify more of these, 
we might be able to say what's an effective strategy to meet whatever this particular difficulty might be. To illustrate this a little bit more, I'm going to show you the newest of the scales, and that is scale 4B, sharing the 4 designation with histrionic personality. This one is what is called the turbulent pattern, and this is a prototype that Dr. Milan has brought forth from the much older psychoanalytic literature and into more the modern era in speaking to something that is more character logic than what we consider as bipolar on the uh, on the clinical symptomology group. Here we're looking at a pattern and it's the only pattern of all the patterns where there's an emphasis on pleasure, on life enhancement, probably to a great extent, especially if you have a high elevation here. And it's very active. So a person a person who fits this criteria and has a significant elevation in this way is likely to show a great deal of energy and a great deal of motivation pushing towards achieving great things in their life, which sounds pretty adaptive, and to a degree it can be. The problem becomes when a person loses a sense of what's realistic and pushes too far into this area, and you begin to see these different characteristics, and this is a representation of all eight of those domains of personality that we might be able to focus our therapeutic efforts on, and descriptions of each. The larger circles in the center are those that are predicted by the theory to be more predominant in a prototypal model. So you have the mercurial mood or temperament, that is the sense of that energization that can be all things to all people. A scattered cognitive style, the idea that we're not going to really be following through in depth on any particular idea, but we're going to continue to, to develop idea after idea after idea and bring it from person to person to person. That then starts to get into the high spirit interpersonal conduct. A person who does this needs to be somewhat exalted in how they look at themselves. And another part that I think is really very important here is um, the dynamics. It's one of the smaller components here, but I think one that's most significant, and that is intrapsychic dynamics down here in the uh, on the lower right. So one of the intrapsychic domains, which really speaks mostly to the defense mechanisms. What is it that a person does when they are challenged that they're not even really thinking about, that just automatically happens, much like a, a defense mechanism would? Most people, when they find that they're getting cues from their environment, that they're too much, that they're expressing too much, that they're becoming overwhelming to other people, would probably take that cue and be able to settle down a bit. This particular personality would be predicted to do the opposite, and that is magnify. And that is if I'm not getting the point across, I'm going to get the point across even stronger than that. And that tends to be the area where they get to be overwhelming to others. They tend to lose attunement to the people in the and uh, situations around them, and they become entirely unrealistic to the point where they really become detached from what's going on in their world, leads towards depression, leads towards a kind of a fall, and can really influence many different aspects of mental health and psychopathology. So that just for one example of all 15 of them, and again, we won't be spending time on this only because of the time that we have, which is rather short. But I like to introduce this notion as well, and that is the uh, overall table of all of the different descriptions that we have. Down the first column, what we have are all of the personality prototypes, and across the top we have the eight functional and structural domains. On the MCMI-4, these are specified in part by the facet scales, and that is that each one of the facet scales represent, or each one of the uh, prototypes has three facet scales that are identified by the theory and then shown out to, uh, to be consistent uh, within the instrument to identify specific areas of most probable difficulties. For example, for the uh, schizoid pattern, I believe it's in passive emo um, emotional expression, unengaged conduct, an apathetic mood. For another, we might have, for example, the avoidant, I believe it's aversive, interpersonal conduct, alienated self-image, and vexatious content, that is uh, object relations. 
different ones for different areas. And what you can begin to see when you have a full readout then is where do the most salient trouble aspects lie. So let's go a little bit now into that being the background. And um, we're going to bypass this just for purposes of time again. I want to get into how it is that we begin to apply the language of this theory into what you might be able to use as feedback. The main point of this particular graphic being that we are continuing to use the MCMI as a multi-axial instrument. We've retained that with the idea that personality is really the arbiter between what's going on.